I think, uh, I think we should get started here. And uh, wow, it's great to see everybody here today. And uh, for our first reading in a fairly interesting and exciting series that we have planned for this semester, I, uh, I hope we're ready for that. I hope we're ready for something interesting because I know what's coming. I want to start today with a note of appreciation to our college. I mean, it's great that our college offers us this opportunity, and they've been doing it. We've been doing it for over 40 years. I have to acknowledge, in particular, the School of Language and Liberal Studies for their help, and the generous support of the Canada Council for the Arts and London Arts Council. Today, Michael Crum. Michael Crum. Well, I'm used to this, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Michael Crummy, and I'm going to invite my colleague uh, Lori Graham, Professor Lori Graham, to uh, introduce Michael. Lori? I don't think I can yell as loud as I'd have to. Hi, everyone. Uh, you can just call me Lori, you don't have to put the professor in front of it. Uh, I'm here to introduce. Newfoundland's own Michael Kelly to you today. I will start introducing him by perhaps uh, bringing up a poet named George Zertis, a Hungarian guy. Uh, he, was, he grew up in Britain and he makes a distinction in a lecture he gave a handful of years ago, makes a distinction between the deceived poet and the true poet. He also talks about the lying poet, which is basically a, a propaganda producer, but that's a whole another story. The difference between the deceived poet and the true poet, as far as Xerxes says, uh, uh, involves, for the deceived poet, they uh, operate disengaged from history, or they negate it, or they pretend it doesn't exist, or with all the hubbubbery of life, they end up just forgetting to talk about the history of themselves, of their lives their place. Whereas the true poet, by comparison, exists very much in the, the historical world that they grew up in. The sentence, in fact, I'll read the sentence to you. Invisibly, secretly, the poet's epic imagination draws on an almost mnemonic compulsion to preserve the past and the dead. An almost mnemonic compulsion meaning we have to remember, a need to remember, a need to write down. And if we take Xerxes distinction to be so, Michael Crummy is a true, true poet. He writes his place very, very often. He comes from Newfoundland, as I mentioned. He writes also uh, fiction in addition to poetry. Um, and something funny always happens when I read his work. When I read his poetry, I think of storytelling. Just like Don Mackay said that uh, language is humanity's bird song, I think storytelling is humanity's memory. And Cr Michael Crummy operates very much on memory, trying to take down the lives and the existences of people who are perhaps fading from our memory, perhaps gone from day-to-day -day life. And funnily enough, when I read his fiction, I think of poetry. I think of language and cadence, that lilt that comes straight off the rock, propelling his fiction. And so I, from what I understand, you're going to read a bit of both today, yes? So you'll maybe hear what I'm talking about, even if you don't. You are in for a real treat. Please give a very warm welcome to Michael Crump. Am I on? I'm plugged in. Um, uh, thanks. It's great to be here. Great to see so many of you up here. I don't know how many of you were forced to be here. Um, either way, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Underneath what is probably the worst picture of me. Whenever I see that, I think, man, who cuts your hair? Um, I'm going to. Uh, we were talking earlier about how this might go, so what we've decided is I'm going to read for about 20, 25 minutes, 
and then take some questions if you have any, and then finish up with another short reading at the end. Does that sound all right? Um, I'm going to start by reading from uh, an old book of mine. This is a, a book called Hard Light that originally uh, came out in 1998 with London, Ontario's Brick Books. And uh, Brick is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year, and as part of that celebration, they pick six of their titles and repackage them as Brick Book Classics. And Hard Light was one of the books they chose, which I'm absolutely thrilled by, mostly because this book, uh, this book is mostly about my father and about his life growing up in Newfoundland in the 1930s and 1940s, pre-Confederation, when Newfoundland was some kind of independent country. And uh, I've always, I mean, I was always, as a child into adulthood, fascinated by my father's life because it was so completely unlike the life that I had growing up. The world that Dad grew up in in Newfoundland in the 1930s and 1940s was pretty much the way people had lived in Newfoundland for 200 or 300 years. I always say that the 20th century was very late coming to Newfoundland. Um, Dad, for example, uh, he started fishing with my grandfather when he was nine years old. They, would, uh, they were taking part in what was called the Labrador fishery. They would leave Newfoundland in the spring, travel down to the coast of Labrador, and spend the entire summer down there fishing. So he started doing that when he was nine. Although he says he, he didn't take on a full share of the crew until he was 11. So he had it easy the first couple of years. But uh, I remember hearing him talk about that world when I was growing up and just feeling like he was a living link to an ancient way of life that had pretty much disappeared in the space of his lifetime. Um, and I wanted to get some of that down on paper before, before it disappeared completely. The other thing I wanted to do, um, my, my father was a fantastic storyteller. I mean, Newfoundland is famous for its oral tradition, and Dad was definitely part of that. He was the kind of person who had a, a repertoire. You could request particular stories from him. And they, were, they weren't told word for word each time, but he had figured out how those stories worked, and they were told in the same, the stories had the same shape and the same turns every time. So part of my motivation for writing this book was actually to steal some of Dad's best stories. So I thought I would start with a couple of those. And this is one he used to tell about his French book. Um, my dad hated school, and his father died when he was 15, and he quit school to take over the family fishery. But um, while he was in school, uh, which was like a one-room school with a populist stove at the back, uh, they were taught French, and it was pre-Confederation, so it was a bit of a mystery why French was in school. Anyway, I think that was his least favorite of all the subjects. So this is my dad talking about his French book. And I should apologize in advance to any Francophones in the moment. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this is called 32 Little Stories. This was before Confederation, so I don't know why we were being taught French at the school. We had a textbook called 32 Little Stories. There was only enough to go around the class, so the teacher would borrow mine during the lesson, and I moved back a seat to share with the person sitting behind me. Kitch Williams would pronounce a word or sentence from the book, and we were supposed to repeat it back to him, but I didn't bother opening my mouth half the time. It was all gibberish to me. Kitch decided he'd had enough of that one afternoon and got me up in front of the class alone. I guess I sounded a bit like a wounded animal trying to heave it out of me. It's a goddamn silly language anyway, if you want my opinion. And the whole school had a good laugh about it. Father had an old shotgun I used to take out hunting cartridge on the weekends with Jet Slade and Patty Fitzgerald. A double-barreled thing that hardly left enough meat on a bird to make a meal of it. The three of us went out over the barrens that Saturday, and I took 32 little stories along with me. Opened it to the correct page, stood it up on an old tree stump, stepped back three paces and shot the fucking thing. <laughs> Had to walk 12, 12 feet past the tree stump to find it. Next French lesson, I moved back to sit at the desk behind me, and Kitch Williams picked up my copy to start. 
the look on his face when he opened it. The book ripped by the lead shot, the paper melted together so you couldn't turn a page. The muscle in his cheek twitching, his eyeglasses shifting on his nose. My son, he said, putting the book on the desk in front of me, if you're not going to take care of this text, it would be just as well to put it in the stove. Mother always said it was a wonder I never got myself shot when I was a youngster. I picked the book up, walked to the potbelly stove at the back of the class, and dropped it in. <laughs> the crackle of 32 little stories echoing around the room as I went back to my seat through the row of desks, the floorboards creaking under my feet. Quiet. My oh, Jesus, it was quiet. No one in that class had a word in their heads to speak. Not of English, and not of French besides. So that was my dad. He was, he was a bit of a hard case as a youngster. Um, and I'll, let's just do a couple more of his stories. This is called, uh, this is a story he used to tell about the shortest man in Western Bay. And it's called Your Soul, Your Soul, Your Soul. Uncle Louis Crummy was the shortest man in Western Bay, five foot nothing, and every inch of that was temper. We had a great bit of fun with him when we were youngsters. After every snowfall, we'd shovel a path from his house down to the brook so he could carry up his water, but we were careful not to make it wide enough for the buckets. <laughs> Uncle Lou was too short to hold the water above the snow. He'd get halfway home when his arms would start dragging with the weight, the buckets banging snowbanks on both sides of the path, slopping water, and he'd find himself standing in front of his door with empty containers. He'd have to turn around and make the trip over again, always with the same result. <coughs> We'd be watching from behind the woodpile to see him the brook to see him throw the buckets down and let fly with the cursing. God damn every long-legged man up in the Burntwood Cemetery, he'd say. Aunt Sally would turn her eyes to the heavens if she was around to hear it. Louis, your soul, your soul, your soul, she'd say. And the more she said it, the more Uncle Lou would swear. We'd, le we'd let him make the trip to the brook five or six times before we came out from behind the shed or the wood pile and offered to get the water for him, as if we were just passing by and wanting to help out. A damn sin what we did. The poor man dead and buried in the burnt woods for years now. Six feet of dirt for you up there, no matter what height you are, alive and standing. Um, I don't know how many of you folks uh, know this, like an old wives' tale in Newfoundland about crows, that if you get your hands on a crow before it fledges, before it learns to fly, and you split its tongue, that when it becomes an adult bird, it'll be able to mimic human speech, like the same as a parrot. Yes, anyone heard that? No. Well, you need to know that for this thing. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is called Old Wives' Tales, and this is Dad talking again. Old Wives' Tales. Except it wasn't a wife talking, or a woman for that matter. It was Charlie Rose at the house to see fathers. I was only five or six years old and not even a part of the conversation, sitting under the kitchen table with the dog, listening to the men talk. Charlie said, you had to get one before it learned to fly and split its tongue. Right down the middle, he said. And when the crow found the use of its wings, it would be able to speak, Arthur, the same as you or I at this table. You know how a child's mind works. The dog was just a pup then, three or four months old, a yellow lab. A hot summer that year, we were sitting outside the day after Charlie's visit, her mouth open, panting, the thin tongue hanging there as pink and wet as the flesh of a watermelon. I loved that animal. I just wanted to hear her speak, is all. Went in the house and brought out mother's sewing shears, held one side of the tongue between my thumb and forefinger, the line down the center, like a factory-made perforation, meant as a guide for the scissors. What a mess that dog made when she drank. Water slopping in all directions, her tongue split like a radio antenna, the separate leaves flailing as she lapped, lapped, lapped at the bowl. 
and not a word in her head for all of that. True story. <laughs> um, I, I had never heard of that old wives' tale before Dad told that story, but uh, since I've started reading this, uh, reading it around Newfoundland especially, I've met at least a dozen people who've known a crow, some of which had their tongues split, but not all, who could mimic human speech. So apparently it's true. Um, I'll just do a couple of more from this, uh, from this book. Um, I was living in Ontario when I decided to try and write this, and I didn't really have a plan for it. I just I went home to Newfoundland, and I took a tape recorder, and sat Dad down to get him talking. Um, I took a trip down to Labrador with him, down the Labrador coast. He hadn't been back there since he was uh, 17 or 18 when he gave up fishing. And, um, and we also spent a night in Western Bay, where Dad was born and raised, in the house where he was born and raised, which was... It had been abandoned for a long time at that point, but was still standing. It still had all the furniture in it. And I remember uh, going through some drawers in an upstairs room, and I found a bunch of legal documents. And there was one legal document, which was uh, a deed of gift. My, it was my great-grandmother signing over a piece of land to my grandmother. And I remember growing up hearing my dad talk about an old man who lived in the house with him when he was growing up, who we called Uncle Bill Rose. And I was in my 20s before I finally figured out that Uncle Bill Rose was actually Dad's grandfather. And he called him Uncle Bill because all older people in, in Newfoundland Outpost were called uncle or aunt by everybody. And when I found this deed, it, it occurred to me that I had never heard anyone mention Uncle Bill's wife. Uncle Bill lived to be 94, I think, and his wife died 30 or 40 years before he, he did. And she, had, she was more or less forgotten. There were no photographs of the woman. I don't even think there's a, a gravestone. So I had this document, which seemed to me to be the only piece of physical evidence that the woman had ever existed. So I, took, I rewrote that document for this book. And it's called Her Mark. I, Ellen Rose of Western Bay, in the dominion of Newfoundland, married woman, mother, stranger to my grandchildren. In consideration of natural love and affection, hereby give and make over unto my daughter, Minnie Jane Crummy of Western Bay, a meadow garden situated at Riverhead, bounded to the north and east by Lovey's estate, to the south by John Lynch's land, to the west by the local road leading countrywards. Bounded above by the sky, by the blue song of angels and God's stars, below by the bones of those who made me. I leave nothing else. Every word I have spoken the wind has taken, as it will take me, as it will take my grandchildren's children, their heads full of fragments, and my face not among those. The day will come when we are not remembered. I have wasted no part of my life in trying to make it otherwise. In witness thereof, I have set my hand and seal this 13th day of December, 1933. And the deed is signed to Ellen Rose, and the name is marked with an X. And the X has been designated her mark. Just one more. Uh, this is a piece about my grandparents, who I never, I never really knew. My grandfather died when Dad was only 15. Uh, my grandmother was around when I was a boy, but I was five or six when she died, and I have no memories of the woman. I can't picture her face. I don't remember a single interaction. Um, I knew three things about my grandparents, more or less. I knew that my grandfather was 20 years older than my grandmother. I knew that he'd been married once before, and his wife had died. And I knew that their first child was a boy who died about a week after he was born. So when I was writing this book, I took those three facts and I spun a fictional story around them to try and explain my grandparents to myself. So this is in my grandmother's voice, and it's called Bread. I was 20 years younger than my husband, his first wife dead in childhood. I agreed to marry him because he was a good fisherman, because he had his own house, and he was willing to take in my mother and father when the time came. It was a practical decision, and he wasn't expecting more than that. 
Two people should never say the word love before they've eaten a sack of flour together, he told me. The night we married, I hiked my nightdress around my thighs and shut my eyes so tight I saw stars. Afterwards, I went outside and I was sick, throwing up over the fence. He came out the door behind me and put his hand in the small of my back. It happens your first time, he said. It'll get better. I got pregnant right away, and then he left for the Labrador. I dug the garden, watched my belly swell like a seed in water, baked bread, bottled baked apples for the winter store, cut the meadow grass for hay. After a month alone, I even started to miss him a little. The baby came early, a few weeks after my husband arrived home in September. We had the minister up to the house for the baptism the next day. Angus McLean, we named him, and we buried him in the graveyard in the burnt woods a week later. I remember he started crying at the table the morning of the funeral, and I held his face against my belly until he stopped, his head in my hands about the size of the child before it was born. I don't know why sharing a grief will make you love someone. I was pregnant again by November. I baked a loaf of bread and brought it to the table, still steaming from the oven. Set it on his plate whole and stood there looking at him. That's the last of that bag of flour, I told him. And he smiled at me and didn't say anything for a minute. I'll pick up another today, he said finally. And that's how we left it for a while. You guys holding up all right? Yeah, I'll just do a couple of, a couple of pieces from uh, uh, my most recent book of poems, Under the Keel, and then uh, we can do some questions. Yeah, so. um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm, the life that I had growing up was completely different from the life my, my father and my mother had growing up in Elmport, Newfoundland. I was born and raised in a mining town in central Newfoundland, a little place called Buckins. Pretty much the geographical center of the island, as far from salt water as you can get, can still be in Newfoundland. So my only connection to that world of the fishery and the ocean was through their stories. Um, the mining town that I grew up in, it was a small town, like maybe 2,500 people. And I remember as a youngster, there was a point where we were kind of let loose on the town. You know, you were kicked out the door and you were expected home at a certain time, but outside of that, you were on your own. And I can rem I remember distinctly during that period, wanting to get into trouble. <laughs> but I was too young even to know what trouble looked like. Like, I didn't know what I was after. So this is a, a piece about that time in, in my life. It's called Boys. <coughs> Not old enough to pay for our trouble, or even name it, we wandered the town after dark like dogs, half-tamed at best, we set small fires and hurled rocks and pissed against school doors, <laughs> nosing the margin of the disallowed, the out-of-bounds. We ranged as far as the train trestle, sniffing underbrush and the long grass for anything dead or lost or unusual, broke into empty buildings for the thrill of stealing through forbidden spaces, of standing at darkened windows, invisible, while the innocent traffic drove past. We perched at the lip of change, we knew it, though in our eyes time itself stood still. We couldn't imagine ourselves at 30, or married, or living other places. What we wanted was to see the world undress, to lie down naked somewhere dirty and fuck, to do all the unspeakable things our green minds could only intuit, a communal urge we suffered alone. Half grown, we were living our life by halves. Our dreams were vacant rooms we didn't own and roamed in silence. Shadows behind dark glass. Our mute hearts a mystery to ourselves. And after I wrote that one, I thought it was only fair that I would write one called Girls. <laughs> Which is how it goes sometimes. 
Their bodies were stripling and sleek and more or less like our own, but for the one alien nook that made them partial to skirts in the Easy Bake Oven, clumsy with a hockey stick. It was the only explanation the world offered for their eccentric habits, their feminine quirks, and it was too simple and stark a truth to be refuted. You stood or sat to take a piss, which was the final word on how a soul was constituted. Even the beauties who were rough and tumble, who were known to pick a fight and could use their fists, carried that internal question mark, a riddle we couldn't solve or evade. They were a fruitless provocation, a rattling kernel of magic we pretended did not exist. Ten years old and already afraid, we'd never get far enough inside that cleft's niggling divide to understand what makes them tick. I still don't know for the record. <laughs> And I'll just do one more and then take some questions. And I'm a little bit nervous about doing this one. Uh, this is a, a poem about my first sort of girlfriend when I was about 12 years old. And, um, and it has caused a little bit of controversy uh, because some people feel like this poem was intended as kind of a slut shame. And which is, uh, I was shocked by that reaction because uh, there is clearly someone in this poem who's being targeted to be shamed. But that person is standing in front of you at the moment. So I hope that comes across. We'll see how it goes. This is called Cock Tease. <laughs> she had a raw mouth for 12. Barely their breasts and a name that made her reckless and surly by turns. She liked to be touched and could see it might be her undoing. She fended off advances with a savage fatalism or shifted just out of reach like a sunbather avoiding a creeping block of shade. It was wrong to want the kind of attention boys were willing to give her and she circled as close as she could without brushing against it. She brushed against it with her eyes averted before startling away like something scalded. I was embarrassed to court her company, but risked the taint for her reputation's promise. Hand working beneath her cotton shirt, fingers grazing the surprising length of a nipple before she bolted, though never far enough to shut the door completely. That crude tug of war was everything on offer between us, and we chafed against each other with a sour sort of affection. All right, any questions? Otherwise, I just keep reading at you. I can get any more. Yeah. You have a lot of small anecdotes in there. I'm wondering how you kind of format them all into a larger story. How do you tie them into each other? Um, you mean in terms of like writing a novel? Yes. Well, they're totally different projects. You know, like when I'm writing the poetry, um, oddly, it's almost always about my life or about the life of the people around me, and uh, and they're all narrative, but they're little short, like a little clips of my life almost. Writing the, writing the long fiction, the novels, is, for some reason, there's nothing of my life in them. You know, like I do not show up in the novels at all. I'm writing about something else altogether. And generally, it seems that my subject, when I'm writing the novels, is Newfoundland. Like it's the place itself. How did that place make us who we are as a, as a culture? And uh, so I'm looking for stories that will sort of unravel that question a little bit. So I'm often collecting anecdotes and things like that that I think would work in the novel. But, I mean, basically, you're just trying to make an arc that will carry, carry a reader's interest for 300 or 350 pages, as opposed to a page and a half. 
That's, the, that's not a very good answer to that question, but that's all I got for you. <laughs> yeah? How do you um, write about a culture that's not necessarily your own, but you are associated with, while maintaining respect for people that are part of that culture? Everybody hear that? that how do you write about a culture that is not your own, that you may be connected to, but is not your own, and maintain the respect for the people that you're writing about? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I do feel, I have said that I wasn't part of that world, right? And that is absolutely true. But I was raised in a town where everybody came from those outports. And my parents were born and raised in those outports. And they brought that culture to that town, you know? So in many ways, I feel like I grew, I did grow up in an outport. Or the outport made me who I am, you know? In the same way that when I look at my kids now, the world that they're growing up in is something I could not have imagined when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. And at the same time, they are Newfoundlanders, you know, and because they've been raised by myself and my wife and by, by the place itself, the place has made us who we are. So I guess part of what I'm doing in that situation is I'm trying to figure out why am I the way I am. Right, so it is my culture, even though <clears throat> the world that I grew up in was very different in, in many respects. But that culture has traveled forward despite the fact that some of the social conditions that created it have disappeared. It is a really tricky, that whole issue of who has the right to tell a story is a really tricky one, right? I mean, there have been a, a number of famous examples of people from away writing books about Newfoundland. And a lot of people in Newfoundland are not very happy with those people. You know, like the most famous one is the shipping news, right, by Annie Proof. And a lot of people in Newfoundland hated that book, my mother being one of them. Uh, and it's, I think it's mostly just because they feel like that uh, they're stealing something somehow. Personally, I had no trouble with that book. I, I felt like... Uh, She lived in Newfoundland for a while, and she found there were things about the culture of Newfoundland that fit her sense of the way the world worked. And she pulled them together and created this fictional universe. So if you go to Newfoundland looking for the Newfoundland that's in the shipping news, you won't find it. You'll find the bits and pieces. But the same is true of her depiction of the United States in that book. If you go to look for that in America, you won't find it. You'll just find the bits and pieces. I felt that it was a fairly respectful way of dealing with the place, artistically. But I mean, there's another book by an American writer. I, I've never been so infuriated by a book in my life, you know, because it seemed like this guy heard of Newfoundland, read some things about it, thought, that's kind of cool, that's not like anywhere else I've heard of, and wrote a book, and whenever Newfoundland didn't suit him, he made something up, right? So he said it in a small Newfoundland outport in 1912 about that. And all of the locals in 1912 in an outport in Newfoundland spend their spare time at the local restaurant. And I mean, Newfoundland outports at that time were subsistence economies. Like, there was no money exchange. It was all a uh, truck system, and people barely had enough to eat. So this notion that they just, in their spare time, were hanging out in a restaurant was completely disrespectful to the place and the people he was writing about. He had a Beothic Indian driving the mailboat. And the Beothic, the, the indigenous people of Newfoundland have been extinct since the 1830s. So I just thought, fuck you is what I thought, honestly. <laughs> because it, it just seemed like he didn't give a shit about the place other than he thought it was kind of interesting and cool. And I think every writer, even if they're writing about their own culture, has to walk that same line, you know? Have, you have to try to find a way to write about the place honestly and respectfully. And, and sometimes you will fall on the wrong side of that line, you know? It's, uh, it's just a, yeah, it's a difficult proposition. <coughs> yeah? Um, when you first started to publish your work, <coughs> your stories being so close to home and based on real things, was it difficult or intimidating to kind of open up your life and your world to the public? Right. Everybody hear that? 
but when I was first starting to publish, was it difficult to kind of expose myself and my, basically my family to the, to the world? Um, uh, I, never, I never really thought about it too much, I guess. Uh, because the writing for me in those, in those days was so private that the thought that it was out in the public didn't really register, I don't think. You know, like it was such a small, even when I published in journals and things like that, um, I mean, no one I knew read those things. So, but, you know, as time went on, it became more and more obvious that I, I was kind of opening up, say, <coughs> my father, my father's life in this book, you know, and, and I, I was writing about my, my parents' lives right from the start, when I started writing when I was 17. And because I was writing, I was trying, basically I was trying to honor those lives, you know. I, was, I always talked about Hard Light as kind of a love letter to my father and to the, that world that he came out of. And because they could see that in what I was writing, I think they didn't really worry too much about it. Although, apparently, my father did say to my mother at one point, you know, you've got to watch what you say to him. Because <laughs> you never know where it's going to end up. So there, there may have been some self-censoring that went on in my family as a result of that concern. But, yeah, I didn't think about it too much. Not as much as I should have, probably. Anybody else? There's a question here. Yes, you often mention the Western Bay in your stories, so yeah. I was wondering what special connection you have to it and how it plays an important part in setting up the um, mood and the tone in your stories. Right. Well, the question is about why I keep mentioning Western Bay and, and what does it have to do with why does it play such an important role in my writing? And it's mostly just because that's where my father was born and raised. So a lot of the, I mean, in Hard Light especially, a lot of the stories start and end in that community. And, uh, and it's, it's really, in, in many ways, the place where I went to learn what an outport was and how it worked, you know. So it's kind of the start and the end of a lot of, of my own writing. But that's just an accident of, that's where my father was born. Really. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. When you're writing, um, depending on poetry or fiction or whatever, um, do you have a certain method of preparation or any sort of thing that you sort of do to psych yourself out and prepare yourself? Um, the question is, my my prep. Do I have anything to get ready? Uh, generally. Um, when I'm writing, especially like a project, if I'm working on a novel or a series of poems or whatever, I try to treat it like a job. You know, I try to work every day. Um, but I have learned over the, over the years that, uh, that procrastination is part of my process. <laughs> and, uh, and that, in fact, that time where it appears that I'm wasting time is really important to me. So, I mean, in the mornings, I start with like, a cup of tea and a basket of laundry and about an hour of sports center, you know? And that, that I need, I can't just get up and sit down at the computer. I need that time, it's sort of like I'm stretching or something, you know? And, um, but after, once I sit down, I try then to work steadily. With, with fiction, I've, in the, the last couple of novels, I've actually set myself a word minimum. Uh, because the hardest thing is to actually sit down and do it. You know, the hardest thing is to actually start putting words down on paper or on the screen. And by setting a minimum, I found that even on my worst days, I could scrape out 500 words. And then even if the next day I deleted 490 of those words, I had 10 words I wouldn't have had if I didn't force myself to do that. And I, I can't remember, there's an, a British author who said, you know, if you write 500 words a day for, uh, for a year, you have a novel. Um, that makes it sound really simple. Uh, but there's some truth to that, you know, that part of it is just making sure that you make the space to do the work, and then you sit your ass down and do the work. So. Yes? I understand that your book's about people around you and your family and stuff, but why not offer the great Jesus, the Newfoundland 
Why not offer what? Sorry. The great humor that they have. Why not offer it? Yeah. How do you mean? Well, when I went to Newfoundland, they're the most humorous and funniest people I've ever met. Right. Why not offer that in your books? Have you read my books? No, not yet. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that that's actually really important to me, and uh, particularly in the novels, like uh, the subjects are pretty serious, but all of them, uh, the humor that people have in their interactions with one another is really a huge part of what the book is about. Um, and in fact, my first novel is a, a book called Vertices, which is about the interaction between European settlers and the Beothic Indians. Um, and I'm, I've never really been happy with it. And I think part of the reason is because there's zero humor in it. And, uh, and it just, that felt untrue to the place, you know? So I think that the humor has always been, or certainly in the last 15 years, has been something that I've worked really hard to make a part of the, of the writing. So, so I hope if you pick up one, you find some of it in there. Because otherwise, I'm I'm sucking at my job. <laughs> one more, I think, and then I'll finish up. Do you find yourself self-conscious uh, when you're about to publish or when you have published something? And if so, how do you kind of overcome the self-consciousness of putting your work out there? Uh, Self-conscious, I'm more terrified than self-conscious <laughs> when I'm publishing that stuff. Um, I, I mean, so much of the writing life is private, right? So much of it is sitting alone in a room. And, uh, and when you put stuff out in the world, you have this kind of terrifying time when you realize you have no control over how people are going to react to it. And I think the one thing that I've learned over time is to ignore most of what people say about it once it's out there in the world, you know, to do the work and then to hope for the best for it, but not to not to pay too much attention to what gets said, you know. I, in some ways it was a really interesting lesson to realize that uh, people's response to a book says as much about them as it says about the book, you know. Everybody's Everybody reads a different book because they're a different reader. And, uh, and so I've tried to make peace with that, you know, and, and just do the work and go from there. We've got about 10 minutes left, not quite. Maybe, maybe six, five six. All right, okay. Um, I'll try some fiction. And if you guys don't laugh at any of this, I'm in deep shit. <laughs> no pressure. This is, uh, I'm going to read a couple of uh, uh, short sections from uh, my most recent novel. This is a book called Sweetland, set on a small island off the south coast of Newfoundland. The island is named Sweetland, and the main character is a man named Moses Sweetland. And, uh, the community on this tiny island, like a lot of the small communities in Newfoundland at this time, is falling deeper and deeper into a state of social and economic crisis because of the Cod Moratorium. 1992, the federal government uh, instituted a moratorium on fishing for cod. And all of these communities in Newfoundland were settled where they were settled for one reason and one reason only, and that's because they were close to where the cod were. And without the cod, Without the cod fishery, most of these communities are completely unviable. And what we started to see in the last 10 years, of course, all of the young people have been leaving to look for work elsewhere. And in the last 10 years or so, we're starting to see communities going to the government and saying, buy us out, give us some money for our houses, we'll move somewhere more central. You won't have to run the ferries out here, you won't have to keep the lights on. You won't have to worry about education or health care in these really isolated, tiny communities. <clears throat> the catch with these programs, up until very recently, the catch was 100% of the people in the community had to sign on. You had to have everybody on board. And I started hearing stories about communities where 
Everybody had signed on for the package except for one person who was holding everything up. And I thought a novel about a, a character like that in one of those communities might be an interesting novel. So I'll just read a short section from the very beginning of Sweetland, uh, which kind of sets it up. He saw the government man walking up from the water, the tan pants, the tweed jacket and tie, the same fellow who came out for the last town meeting, or one exactly like him. There seemed to be an endless supply on hand at the Confederation Building in St. John's. The briefcase looking for all the world like something that was in his hand when he left his mother's womb. <laughs> Sweetland turned away from the window as he could hide from the man by not looking his way. Glimpsed the flash of him as he went to the front door of the house, heard the knock. No one in the cove ever knocked at a door. He thought to ignore it, but the knock came a second and then a third time and he pushed away from the table, went out through the hallway. No one in the cove used their front doors, either. Sweetlands hadn't been open in years, and he had to jimmy it loose of the frame. The man standing there lost in the sun's glare, a voice from the nothing where his mouth should be. Mr. Sweetland. He waited until the figure resolved out of the light, until he could see the eyes. Just come off the ferry, did you? Just this second, yes. Sweetland nodded. I must be some fucking important, he said. <laughs> the government man smiled up at him. You're at the top of my list, he said. Sweetland stood to one side to let the man by. Cup of tea? You don't have coffee by any chance. I got instant. Tea is fine, the government man said. Sweetland moved the kettle onto the stove while a young one took a seat at the table. He tried to think of when a stranger sat there last seeing the kitchen for the first time. Low ceilings, the beams an inch or two clear of Sweetland's crown. Painted wood floor, a daybed under one window. His mother's china teacups on hooks below the cupboards. All so familiar to him he hadn't noticed it in years. The man's briefcase was lying on the table in front of him like a placemat and Sweetland set a spoon in the sugar bowl on the flat surface of it. No sugar for me, the youngster said. He took a blackberry from his coat pocket and held it to the window a moment. You're not the fellow who was out last time around, are you? No, I just took over the file. You won't get a cell phone signal out here, Sweetland said. He shrugged. The edge of the civilized world. I was talking about putting up a tower years back. Never got around to it. The government man gestured past him to the counter. You have a laptop there, he said. Sweetland glanced over his shoulder to confirm the fact. We got the internet for long ago. Does my banking on that, he said. Bit of online poker. Passes the time. Sweden poured the tea and took a seat directly across the table. The government man said, you're not on Facebook, are you? Look at this face, he said. And the government man glanced down at the table. Now our book, Sweden said. That's something I'm signing up for. I'm sure it's coming, the government man said. I wouldn't doubt it, given the state of things. It was an easy road into the subject at hand, and he was surprised the government man didn't take it, smiling at the window instead. Perfect teeth. They all had perfect teeth these days. Careful haircuts, accents Sweetland couldn't place. This one might be from the mainland somewhere, for all he could tell. So, the younger man said abruptly, are you coming to the meeting this afternoon? Sweetland almost laughed. Not planning on it, no. I couldn't talk you into it. Listen, Sweetland said, I'm not the only one who voted against this thing. That's true, 45 in favor, 3 against by the most recent ballot. But as of yesterday, yours is one of only two households who have not agreed to take the package we're offering. Two, Sweetland said. The government man paused there to let the information sink in. It's just me and Loveless. That's where things stand, the government man said. Sweetland rubbed absently at the tabletop a moment and then excused himself. He went out through the hall and up the narrow stairs to the bathroom. He put the toilet seat down and sat there a few minutes leaning an elbow on the windowsill. He could see the back of Loveless's property from there. The ancient barn, the single gaunt cow with its head to the grass. Loveless famously drank a pint of kerosene when he was a toddler. 
which to Sweetland's mind told you everything you needed to know about the man. <laughs> he had suffered a 24-hour attack of hiccups while he passed the fuel, his diapers reeking of oil and shit. No one was allowed to light a match near the youngster for a week. <laughs> and it was all down now to him and to fucking Loveless. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that time.